Okay, yeah. well, that's that's one topic. Thank you, thank you very much for your help in in that. I do appreciate it. Um, the other one would be the strange claim I read on page sixty three of Enjoy Life Forever. If we could look at this briefly, it's lesson fifteen. Who is Jesus? And in oh, the right, just give me a second. Yeah, to yeah, sure, I sure. Catch up. Yeah, sorry, my book could be lesson fifteen. Yep. Okay. Just a second. Yep. Um, it says in le- uh, paragraph three, after Jesus's life as a human ended, he was resurrected as a spirit and he returned to heaven. There God exalted him to a superior position. Now Jesus has position of great authority. Sorry. I'm just being texted, um, which is Don't rather annoying. Carry. So it says after Jesus's life as a human ended, I believe Jesus died. It said he, w- he was resurrected as a spirit. Well, I believe Jesus was resurrected. And then it says, and he returned to heaven. I believe he returned to heaven, but I don't believe he resurrected as a spirit. I would happen to believe that Jesus resurrected in the same body that he died in. Um, I think there's ample evidence for that. But one would be a prophecy in John 2, 19 to 21. Do you mind if I could please read it? Certainly. John chapter 2, verse 19, Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days, that's the number of days in the tomb, I will raise it up. All right, uh-huh. now verse 20, the Jews completely misunderstand him. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. Verse 21, we're back to the same context by Jesus, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. Body there is soma in Greek. Robert Gundry did a word study on soma. He wrote a book on it, and he proved that every time that soma is applied to a, a man, a woman, a child, a human being, it always means a physical body. It never means a body made out of spirit. And he, he says he's going to raise his physical body in verse 19. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. That's the temple of his body in verse 21. Uh, and body there is singular, by the way. It's not plural. I was a bit shocked that your insight in the scripture talked about Jesus resurrecting in multiple bodies. He rose as a spirit body you claim in your literature but then after his resurrection as a spirit he manifested on a temporary basis numerous different physical bodies somewhere around 10 so i I was kind of a bit shocked about that and i'm just wondering is there any evidence in the bible that jesus resurrected as a spirit because he clearly prophesies he's going to rise up in the same body that died and that's why he kept showing the marks of crucifixion and the the hole in his side to doubting Thomas and the disciples in John 20 and in Luke, the last chapter of Luke, Luke 24. I think it's verse 39 or somewhere around there. I'd have to find the verse. Um, He shows them his hands and his side. Uh, Yes, Luke 24, 39. Behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself. So this is not a ghost or a manifestation of Jesus. It's it's I myself. Handle me and see. That's a strange thing to say if he's a spirit creature. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not, not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. So surely Matthew 24 39 and 40 surely he rose in the same body that he died in that's why he kept showing people his hands and his feet because he his body bore the marks of crucifixion because it was the same body that died on the tree surely yes so certainly he used he showed that to uh thomas um when but when you think of some of the other um, at times that Jesus was physically seen following his resurrection uh, sh- shortly after he was seen uh, by Mary in the garden she didn't recognize Jesus she thought he was a gardener um, well it if, was dark it was uh, it was it was dark on the, on the road to Emmaus well, that's uh, a... he witnessed to two of the disciples again who did not recognize who they were walking with 
uh, if they had been close followers, which uh, the verses said they were. Could um, I respond to that? That's a separate sorry. context. The road to Emmaus, Luke 24. Um, it says in verse 15 that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But then in verse 16, it says, but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. So God himself restrained their eyes at that particular time from recognizing him. It says that their eyes were opened in verse 31. Then their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. So the reason they didn't recognize him uh, on the road to Emmaus was that their eyes were restrained by God. So they didn't recognize him. It was God's will for them not to recognize him at that time. He opened their eyes so they could recognize him later. Um, the women at the tomb, I think it was simply dark. Uh, they probably didn't recognize him because it was dark. They weren't expecting him to have resurrected from, from the dead. And although it was, yeah, that would be my explanation of that. Right. But, Scriptures uh, don't say it was dark. Um, the conversation that they had, uh, she was conversing with him and uh, as the gardener and asking where Jesus had been, body had been taken. Um but there are other scriptures which um, indicate that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. Uh, so, um, well, ho hold on. Let's again, do one thing at a Jesus time. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, let's do one thing at a time. Luke twenty-four, verse one. Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing with bringing the spices which they had prepared so it does say very early in the morning it could be that it was just dark that's why it was you know it was dark because it was very early in the morning that could be why they didn't recognize him i don't think we can reject the clear doctrine of christ's resurrection in the same body that died on the tree because of some some vagary i think we have to be very clear if we're going to reject the resurrection i think we have to be very clear about that so that's my response to um the women at the tomb you mentioned 1 corinthians fifteen fifty. um let's go there i don't think that verse is really even relevant it says very, very clearly earlier on that he rose in the same body that he died in. Verse 50, I think you have to really read to verse 54. It's not, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. You didn't read, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. This isn't talking about Jesus. The context here is talking about fallen, unredeemed humanity. So if somebody dies in their sins, think of somebody like Hitler. Okay, Hitler hated Christ. He hated the Bible. He hated Christians. Uh -huh. And he died by his own hand. He committed suicide in his bunker. After one of his enormous temper tantrums, he shot himself. Hooray. <laughs> so Hitler died in his sins. Hitler is not going to be raised in an incorruptible, sinless, glorified human body. So if you think of someone like Hitler as an example, or Stalin, or Mao Zedong, who actually murdered more, more people than Hitler and Stalin put together, it's talking about people like them who haven't received salvation and who will not be um, resurrected in an, in, a, in an uncorruptible, glorified human body. So if I read from verse 50 to 54, I think it's abundantly clear that that's what's being discussed. Now, this I say, so brethren... If you, just, if, if you just go back to 45... Yeah, I can, I can, I can, I can certainly, certainly do that. 44 and 45. Um, spirit, it doesn't say spirit. It says spiritual plumaticos. Could I read 50 to 54? Sorry. Comment on it. And then if you want to go back to verse 45, that's absolutely fine. So... 1 Corinthians 15, 15. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, so nor does corruption inherit incorruption. So the context is corruptible human flesh. It's not talking about Jesus. It's not saying Jesus can't inherit the kingdom of God. It's talking about sinners. Think of Stalin, Hitler, Mao Zedong, people who die hating Christ, hating the gospel, they die in their sins. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. The context is not Christians or Jesus. 
Verse 51, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. That's the glorification of the human body at Christ's return. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. That's the glorification of the human body at Christ's second coming. For this corruptible, you and me, all human beings on earth, we live in corruptible human bodies. That's why we die. Um, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. That's That happens at Christ's return, the glorification of the human body. Um, although I should add, some people confusingly say that that will be after a thousand year millennium, but I don't, I don't hold to that position. Verse 54, so when this corruptible has put on incorruption, that's the glorification of the human body, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is followed up in victory. So this has got nothing to do with Christ. It's not saying that Christ and Christians... Um, are, uh, w will be in corruption and that Christ and Christians won't inherit the kingdom of, of God. It's talking about sinful people who've rejected the gospel like Hitler. They are not going to be raised in incorruptible physical bodies. They will die in their sins and they'll be judged in their in that particular state, in their resurrected bodies, but not glorified human bodies. So it's got nothing to do with Christ. That's my explanation of verse 50. Do you have anything to say on that? Or do you, do you want to go back to verse 45? Uh, I think that there is uh, in, in the chapter from 42 onwards, uh, which includes 50 to 54, which you've read, a uh, discussion about the resurrection. Um, and that, that kind of the context goes all the way through, but specific verses do refer to, directly to Jesus so uh, 45 um, obviously I'm reading the New World Translation so it'll, it'll be different from, from mm -hmm. the version you're reading from there uh, but in 45 it says the first man Adam became a living person the last Adam became a life giving spirit mm -hmm. um, and that was a, a definite reference directly to Jesus becoming, becoming a life giving spirit uh, which is also borne out, I think it's off the top of my head, I think it's First Peter 3.18. We need to do one thing at a time rather than... Yeah, no, yeah. I think the, 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 the two thoughts link up because Peter reiterates this where he says that Jesus was put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit. So Adam lost the right to life. It Jesus doesn't, brought that back. It doesn't say in Peter he's made alive as a spirit. It's in flesh, in spirit, because they're both dative. Although a few Bibles um, do, do, do read differently, um, made alive by the spirit. But can we deal with one thing at a time? Could we look so, at verse 42 to 45? Maybe if you read it and then make your point. Do you want to read from verse 42? 42 to 45, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised up in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised up in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised up in power. It is sown a physical body, it is raised up a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual one. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a, life -give, uh, became a living person, and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Right. Um, the first thing I'd say here is that as a Christian... Um, I would believe in the Trinity, which teaches that Christ has two natures. He's eternally God, Yahweh, or Jehovah, as you call God. Uh, and, and Jehovah is spirit, John 4, 24. So Christ has eternally been a spirit in his deity. In his humanity, Christ has a full, full human nature of body, physical body, and also a human soul or human spirit so i certainly believe that christ is a spirit in his deity he is eternally a spirit uh, i would also believe that christ confusingly rather strangely also has a human spirit he has two spirits 
because if he didn't have a human spirit, if he, was, if he was just a human body and he didn't have a human spirit, he wouldn't be a full human being. Now, the text doesn't say in verse 45 that he became a spirit. If you read it carefully, it says the last Adam became, quote, a life giving spirit. So I wouldn't know whether this refers to Christ's deity. Did he bestow spiritual life through his deity um, upon those people who are being saved? in verse 45 or was it his human spirit um, but it doesn't say he became a spirit the context is life-giving spirit and that's talking about salvation if I read from verse 42 my Bible reads a little bit differently uh, okay. so it is so also is the resurrection of the body of the dead Sorry, I'm dyslexic. I, I get confused very easily. Um, the body, that's in italic, so it's not in the Greek text. I think you said it or something like that. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. So it's definitely talking about the human body. And it's talking about the body of Christians. The context will be Christians here. They're going to die. But when they're raised up at Christ's return, it will be in an incorruptible body. The Bible talks about justification which is applied to our uh, spirit or soul. We declared righteous, the point of salvation. We're then supposed to live a, a holy life where we try to serve Christ to the best of our imperfect abilities. That's sanctification, where we make the effort to try and serve Christ uh, and be faithful to him. At Christ's return, because sanctification is never never perfect, unless you're an extreme Methodist or an extreme uh, there's a tiny group of Methodists and some extreme Pentecostals who believe you can have sinless perfection here on earth, which is ridiculous. With the exception of extremists like that, um, it is at Christ's second coming, when the body is raised from the, the dead, that it will be raised as a sinless, glorified human body and be reunited with our human spirit or soul. So verse 43 it is sown in dishonor, so we come out of our mother's womb under the curse of sin. That's why we age and die. Even babies age and die. If there's no such thing as original sin, then babies would be sinless. Babies would never die. Uh, it is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. Raised in glory refers to the glorification of the human body at Christ's return. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. So it's just repeating the same thing from different angles. Now it's going to be repeating it for the third time, perhaps clearer for us. It is sown a natural body. Body there is soma. Remember Robert Gundry's work on, um, he did a book on the word soma. Every time soma is applied to a human being, it always means a physical body. So it is sown a natural body. That means, you know, we come out of our mother's mother's womb in a physical body. Uh, we are not just a physical body. We also have a human soul or spirit. It is raised a spiritual body. Now, spiritual is not the same as spirit. Spirit is pneuma. Spiritual is plumatikos. Plumatikos means uh, under spiritual control or a spirit dominated body. Uh, I can prove that because the same word plumatikos is used of Moses um, giving them spiritual food to eat. When Israel were in the wilderness, 1 Corinthians 10, um, I'll read from verse 1 to verse 4. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Here's the verse, verse 3. All ate the same spiritual, that's the same word, plumatikos, food, and all drank the same spiritual plumatikos drink. Now, when is Israel was led through the wilderness, they didn't eat spirit, spirit food made of spirit. They ate physical food, the manna from heaven, and they drank water, literal water. But it's called spiritual here, plumatikos, because it's supernaturally provided by God which is the meaning of plumatikos. And that's the word that's used in verse 40. Uh, 
44. It is sown a natural body. We come out of our mother's womb. Okay, in a physical, natural, physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. And that's talking about the glorification of the Christian saints. Um, at Christ's second coming. Now it's repeated. There is a natural body. There is a spiritual body. It doesn't say spirit. It doesn't say a body made of spirit. And verse 45, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Last Adam would be Christ. It doesn't say no. he became a spirit. It says he became a life-giving spirit. Now, I am actually, I've been wanting to know the answer to this for some time. Is that Christ in his divine spirit? His deity, he becomes a life-giving spirit. Or would that be a reference to Christ in his physical human spirit becoming uh, a life-giving spirit the context is he bestows he bestows spiritual life upon his his people um, that would be my understanding of verse 42 to 45 it doesn't say christ became a spirit from his from his um from that time onwards he bestows spiritual life salvation upon his 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 people So, again, this this is uh, with reference to those who would rule with Christ in heaven, uh, that they couldn't enter heaven to be part of that kingdom government arrangement with physical bodies. We need to prove that. It's no good just saying that. You know, Mormons uh-huh. tell me all sorts of things. Christadelphians tell me all sorts of things. I've spoken to Iglesia Ni Christu, and I've spoken to extreme Pentecostals and Charismatics. They all, they all will make statements, but you have to open your Bible and prove what you're saying from the Bible. Otherwise, I'm obliged to just totally ignore any statement that I'm told that can't be proven from Scripture. Okay. So, um, if, if, if you're happy for me to, to cross-reference that with First Peter 3 and verse 18, I don't know how, what that says in, in your Bible. It reads um, differently. It reads differently, which I'll go into. But do you have any comment on uh, verse 42 to 45 before we move on to something else? It doesn't say in verse 45, the last Adam became a spirit. Christ has eternally been spirit. In his deity, Christ is the same spirit think, as the I Father and the Holy Spirit. Think, again, that, that's where we would differ that your belief as a Christian is in is in a Trinity, right. whereas we be, we don't believe that Jesus is part of a Trinity. I don't believe Christ is part of a Trinity. That's partialism. I'm a Trinitarian, and right. if we discuss the Trinity, we would need some time for me to explain yes. what I believe carefully before we look at that. And I would suggest not now because um, I'm quite tired after the um, events of today. Uh, yeah. when I was making that video for this incredible dome. Well, it wasn't a video, it was an audio. Um, right. Do you do you have anything to say on 1 Corinthians fifteen forty two to 45, on what I said? You you understand it doesn't say it is raised, it, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spirit body. It doesn't say you're raised as a pneuma spirit body. It's spiritual plumaticos. And plumaticos means spirit dominated. And body, soma, always means in verse 44 it is raised a spiritual body every time soma the greek word soma body is applied to a human being in scripture every single time robert gundry has proven it always means a body of flesh i've not read his work to be honest um well if you can refute it fine oh. if you can refute right, it fine but that but, but there are no there are no exceptions there are no exceptions in the bible there's no instance where um somebody is called a, a soma in in the greek new testament body soma and it means that they are actually a physical bo- uh, sorry a, a body of spirit like an angel or I think the, the contrast for, for me, the contrast in, in, in the, the verses, uh, and it goes down through from 42 and then 347, 48 to the verses you read from 50 to 54, it, it is the contrast between a physical body and a spiritual body. Uh, f- a physical body cannot enter into uh, the heavenly realm. It doesn't say that. You have to show me that from the scripture. From verse 46 to 49, it's a contrast between the first man, Adam, who due to his sin 
came under sin and his progeny were under sin and then the Lord from heaven who solves that sin problem. Then in verse 50, um, having, having talked in the previous few verses about the contrast between Adam and Christ, then in verse 50, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. You didn't read this, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. The context now would be those people who have died in their sins. Think of Hitler, Stalin, Mao Zedong murderers who died hating christ is it such a narrow i mean if if we're looking at a a group of people who would go to real with christ in heaven we wouldn't include those individuals right this would be talking about anointed christians who have been specifically um chosen by god to be in this role so when it's their, their corruptible bodies would have to would not be able to enter into heaven to be part of that arrangement. I agree. Hitler, Stalin, Mao Zedong won't enter into the kingdom of God. It says, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, think of Hitler, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption, Hitler died in his sins under corruption, inherit incorruption. Hitler was never, never was granted salvation. Hitler cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So the the context for verse 50 would not be Christ and Christians. It would be people who died in their sins, people who died hating Christ like Hitler. He's not going to enter into the kingdom of God. That's the context for verse 50, which you didn't respond to. You didn't really give me, if I'm wrong, you need to show me where I'm wrong. Well, the whole context there is those who will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, for us, the kingdom of God, uh, again, this is quite a big topic and we need to go to other Bible verses. There are, there are two distinct groups. One, which will go to heaven to rule with Christ as part of a kingdom government, which this particular passage is directed to. So it's not those who are, you know, the examples you've used, Hitler, Mao Zedong, Stalin, uh, they would never be part of that agree- arrangement anyway. Paul is talking to anointed Christians in the Corinthian congregations, reminding them of the hope that they have, that their resurrection, uh, so in verse 52, that their resurrection from corruption to incorruption would have to be. Uh, and when we think about Jesus, when he came to the earth, he, he was a spirit. And that he took on a fleshly body. What do you mean? So, what do you mean when he came to this earth? He was a spirit. When when his life force was transferred transferred to the womb of Mary, he was born as a, a human. So when he went back to heaven following his resurrection, why would he go as a human? Why wouldn't he be changed into the form he was before he came to the earth? Um, because when he took on humanity, it was a it was something permanent for Christ. He permanently took on a human nature. It wasn't something like a, a clothes. I mean, for instance, I'm I'm wearing a uh, because I don't heat my place. I'm a poor guy. I'm wearing a, a onesie at the moment. I look quite ridiculous in it. It's a snowman onesie, and it's very furry, and it keeps me extremely warm even when it's cold. Now, when I go to bed, I'm going to take it off. I'll just throw it on the sofa and take it off and then go to bed. Um, That's not how the Bible describes Christ's humanity. His humanity was added to his nature at the incarnation. And it, it was a it was a permanent thing, not a temporary thing like me temporary putting on a onesie and then taking it off and if it's a warm day tomorrow then I won't actually wear it if it's going to be too too warm to wear it okay uh, well that's uh, yeah the context of the verse to me again speaks of which verse uh, the, you can't take one in isolation it is the, the whole passage because uh, again you've got to kind of bear in mind well why don't you read from verse 42 to 54 uh, and explain each each verse because any, 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 any anyone can seize upon two or three words and give an ex- explanation i've spoken 
for hours to Mormons, Christadelphians, Pentecostals, Iglesia Ni Christu, and they can talk for hours yeah. on a, a, a two or three words and give them the most strange interpretations and meaning. What they can't do is read an entire passage of 10 or 20 verses and explain each passage in turn cogently and coherently. And, and and explain what each verse means and how it relates to the previous verse and the verse after it. You know, if you just look at three or four words in isolation, you can prove anything. It says in verse 50, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. OK, so, uh, you know, you're taking that to mean people go to heaven as spirits. This is not what the text says. You're missing the entire con context of the passage from verse 42 right on to verse 54. It's talking about the contrast between Christ and Adam from verse 46 to 49. And then it briefly mentions those people who've died in their sins, who are not Christians, who have not been granted salvation. And for people like that who well, the, is, flesh is, and blood cannot the inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption. Yeah. When it says corruption, that's talking about people who've died in their sins. They can't inherit incorruption, eternal life. That's that's well, the top. meaning of verse 50. It's got nothing whatsoever to do with Christians or Christ. Um, but the whole passage is uh, addressed to Christians in the Corinthian congregations. It's not addressed to... But you, need to but you need to explain, but you need to explain the whole passage from verse 42 to 54 to make your point and explain everything and show how everything relates to two other things. I mean, uh, you know, I'm still uh, a bit confused about verse 45. The last Adam became a life giving spirit. Is that a reference to Christ and his deity? Because Christ has eternally been spirit. OK. Or is it a reference to Christ's human spirit? Is it in his human spirit that he grants eternal life to those who come to salvation who are his people? I don't know the answer to that. You know, I'm, I'm going to look into that some more. You've, been cha you've challenged me because of that. But I have been thinking about that verse for several months, and I'd like to know the answer to that. Um, but if you explain scripture, you see, it's no good just taking two or three words no. Because anyone can do that. Mormons, anyone can twist, twist anything with it. Yeah. Anyone can say anything about a passage of the Bible. I mean, yeah. people pick up the Bible and to Mormons, Christadelphians, Baptists, Roman Catholics, extreme Pentecostals, the same passage means totally different things. And it's usually because they're just focusing on two or three words and they're ignoring the immediate context. Which is why the whole passage... Uh, uh, ignoring, you know, you, uh, you make a good point there because you can't just take two or three words and, and make something of it. You have to take the whole thing um, and the context of it from 42 down to, I guess, almost to the end of the chapter, almost to 57. Um, Paul was addressing his letter to fellow Christians who had a heavenly hope uh, even before 42 he was making the point that uh, there are two different you know the, there is flesh and then there is spirit bodies and sorry what, it doesn't say spirit where does it say spirit bodies it's spiritual it's plumaticos in verse 44 um, verse 44 it is sown a natural body body is soma it is raised a spiritual plumaticos so when, body soma. So, in, so it doesn't okay, say so fact, it doesn't say does, spirit body. It doesn't say spirit body. Spirit is how numa. Does, it's how does spiritual. Verse 40 reads in your, your Bible. Forty. Yeah. Forty is not a reference to human beings. It's talking about the stars and the, well to in the context of the time they would see the planets like Venus and, and Mercury and, and Jupiter. <coughs> as the celestial bodies along with the stars. So it's really wow. irrelevant. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one, verse 41, there is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. These are not human beings. So the context is not, it's not relevant then, to our discussion. Then the, but then in the start of verse 42, 
it talks about the resurrection of the dead. It's a new context. But it, it's, it says, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. It's talking about... So Paul, it's talking Paul about was the, linking with what he was just saying, because that, that is a, an expression, so it is, links mm. with what he had just been discussing. Yes. Um, it's talking about a glory, the glory of the stars, how impressive they are. And now he's talking in verse 42 about the resurrection of the dead, that they're going to be raised up, but they will be raised up in glorified plumaticos soma. Plumaticos soma in verse 44 is spiritual bodies. And bodies, soma, always refers when it's applied to a human being to a physical body. It's not applied to human beings in verse 40 and 41. It's being applied in different contexts to stars and planets. So it's talking about one glory of the stars and planets in verse 40 and 41. Verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It's talking about the glorification of these people. And in verse 50, when it says flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God, context, context is important. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. When it says nor does corruption inherit incorruption it's talking about the lost i gave you the example of hitler okay the yeah. lost won't inherit the kingdom of god it doesn't actually in, in, it doesn't actually degree, say we, they we, won't go to it doesn't actually mention heaven it says kingdom of god but they're not going there either if you feel that that it applies to that group uh, but when you actually consider corruption like you said, we were all born under sin, in sin. So we're all in that state, whether we are sinners of the magnitude of Hitler, Stalin and uh, the others, or we're not. We're, we're all in a corruptible state because of what we've inherited. Um, so Paul was writing here to fellow Christians... He was directing these words to fellow Christians who were as sinful as he was, saying that, well, we're all in corruption, but we've got to put on incorruption. No, no, no. Following we, our resurrection. No, we don't put on incorruption. Christ puts. Yes, we're so, raised from yes. the dead by Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And yeah, we're raised in a state. He was speaking to Christians. He wasn't talking to those, as I think you used the expression, the lost. Well, he does mention the lost in verse 50. Now, this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, the context is unredeemed, fallen flesh and blood, who haven't been um, born from above, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Here's the context, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Um, salvation is rather difficult because salvation is applied in two stages. Um, it's applied to the human soul or spirit at conversion, where we're justified, but it's not applied to our physical bodies. That's why we age and we die. If you look at me, you know, I, I, I've got white hair. I look quite pathetic sometimes. And I've, I've got, got bad knees. And I, I, I'm dothery when I walk down the road because I've got bad knees and my, my teeth are falling out. And I, I get a miserable old so-and-so sometimes. Uh, <laughs> so salvation hasn't been applied to my physical body. But that's a future promise. It's called glorification, which will happen at Christ's return. I'm a little bit concerned because I think I said to the person who texted me 40 minutes and he should be phoning quite soon. Could I ask, um, could we talk again some other time? Certainly. Um, basically, the best thing to do is for you just to call me any evening. Um, if you can okay. let me know... Uh, the well, day I'll before is, I'll, I'll, WhatsApp, I'll whatsapp you the day before or something we'll, we'll make an arrangement that's you know you don't need to make convenient. an arrangement just tell me when you're going to call the next day that, that and i'll be yeah, by the phone you know if you're busy you know if you've got other things yeah. on you know we've got busy life just say not convenient yeah. and we'll do it another, another yeah. day i'm i'm expecting someone someone to call me soon so i do have to go so. If if I could look at another time, lesson thirteen, paragraph two, which is on warfare and politics, that was something else that puzzled me. So lesson fourteen Le two. Lesson thirteen: How false religion misrepresents God, and it's paragraph two on politics and warfare. Okay. 
that that would be really 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 great thank you very much indeed i'm afraid i do have to go because no i'll be getting a call any time now thank you so much for your time sir thank you all right take care take care bye bye bye